we have Ms. Pallavi Bedi, who is partner Lutra and Lutra Law Offices. She is practicing in the area of projects and uh, project finance with a focus on oil and gas, power, renewable energy and mining. She has also been involved in airports and urban infrastructure projects. And in her current role, she advises clients on concession agreements, gas sale and purchase agreements, power purchase agreements, off-take agreements, TPC contracts and ONM contracts for diverse projects. We also have Mr. Mohan Kumar, Chief Executive Projects at Texmaco Rail Engineering uh, Limited, has 29 years of experience uh, encompassing a gamut of um, varied responsibilities, including strategic planning, tendering, sales and marketing operations, along with profit and loss management. Uh, we also have Mr. Sumit Mehta, who is Business Head Railway Electrification and Head Business Monitoring Group at Tata Projects. He has experience in EPC projects, uh, railways and power sector primarily for project management, monitoring, contract administration, team management, and strategizing business development in domestic and international market. And we have Mr. C. Uh, Sankara Lingam, who is advisor at NNT Construction, has more than 37 years of experience in civil and structural engineering, including project development, design and construction. And he joined LNTCC in 1980 and has successfully completed 26 infrastructure projects and has also worked as construction manager in the Concord Railway. A very warm welcome. I can see Mr. Mohan Kumar also now joined in. So let me just uh, begin with a few questions from my side to each one of you. And Ms. Bedi, I'm going to come to you a little later. Uh, let me just first hear from the contractors. And after that, I would like to take your feedback on how we can address some of their challenges. I would also give an opportunity to the contractors to address some questions to you uh, if they have any. And uh, let me first begin with Mr. Sankra Lingam. Uh, sir, if you could first just highlight uh, your experience uh, after COVID. So mainly in 2020-21, um, how has the rail construction really fared for LNT? And how do you think the past uh, five or six months have been looking uh, after the second wave has been over? So just some broad numbers or some broad trends that you could give in terms of uh, LNT's uh, progress in the last uh, one and a half years. Thank you, Ritika. Anyway, uh, uh, have a warm welcome to all our participants. Uh, from the LNT point of view, after this, I think COVID, Really, it was started in last year, March. So there is a setback initially, you know, there's a lockdown, everything. And then after the lockdown is over, I think the government has taken a lot of initiatives and then, you know, floated so many, you know, projects. And we were really very uh, great to the, you know, the government as well as, you know, the uh, public sector. So we secured quite a lot of projects particularly, you know, bullet trains and then metros, Chennai, Metro, Bangalore, Metro, as well as Mumbai, you know, you know, the other uh, ring road projects, plus RVNL projects. So as such, you know, as a business is going in a full swing, there is no death of job. And really, we have set back about the workman where probably they're all, you know, a little bit, you know, the kind of um, um, rather movement of certain people was restricted due to this, you know, the containing the COVID. So they were a little bit panic. So if it is now slowly it is settling down. So the things are become normal. And also now we know that how do we live in this kind of difficult situations, which I don't think it just is going to be, you know, vanish one day or two days. It's going to be there for some more time. They were all talking about uh, next two waves, three waves and all. So we are prepared to at least face this kind of issues. At the same time, we can't let the project or the development cannot be stopped. So things are you know, moving as usual. And uh, I mean, I can say that I think you know, it's all right. So we are all, uh, prepared for this, you know, the future uh, rather the growth also. In fact, I think the index is going very high. Now it's going almost 57, 58,000. So it's good trend. And also, you know, the things it's, you know, looking good. So I'm a little bit optimistic. So I'm thinking everything will go very well. That's that's from there. So in the current year, uh, are you expecting um, to do more than what was done in 2020, 21? Yes, the scopes are very high. I think, you know, it's coming up with, you know, many more tenders, particularly in national highways, they are opening up. 
and also I think the metros opening up, railways also coming mm. up with you know the bullet train. Some of that you know the things are in the tendering stages come up. So we are optimistic. So I'm sure I think the things may go the same current trend or slightly may go to the higher elevation also. Okay. I'll come to Mr. Mehta now. So, Mr. Mehta, what was Startup Logic's experience in 2020-21? How did you close the year? And uh, what was the kind of rail construction that you could achieve? And how have the past six months uh, fared for the current fiscal? Almost five months. I mean, sixth one has just started. Yeah, first of all, a uh, warm welcome to all my colleagues and uh, senior leadership over here and my all industry participants. It's a very good platform to discuss our experiences, share knowledge, and we gain something or the other from each other. So coming back to the question, Ritika, uh, I would say 2021 has been fairly good for us and we have progressed really well. We could commission the EDFCC Eastern Dedicated Freight Corridor last year, which was, I would say, a very big achievement for the nation itself because it was inaugurated by our Prime Minister. And uh, that was around a 350 kilometer stretch, which was dedicated for the freight train movements. And that was really need of the hour. And uh, apart from that, in the railway electrification, we could do around 700 TKM in the last financial year, in spite of the COVID wave and all. And uh, we learned through the challenges we could deliver. That was almost the double we, which we could do last to last year. So this COVID mm -hmm. has uh, taught us now how to uh, accept the challenges, the agility part of it, and be ready for the future as uh, my senior colleague was just mentioning from LNT that yes, uh, we, people are talking about third wave, fourth wave. Uh, this is going to be a continuous process and it's going to be a part of life now. So honestly speaking, uh, we have to get adaptable to it and be ready for the future challenges. This year also we have, uh, I mm -hmm. would say, huge targets to achieve and uh, I'm confident that with the support of the ecosystem, uh, we will be able to achieve it. And uh, this year again, we are going to commission uh, one section for the dedicated freight corridor and we are targeting somewhere around again 700 TKM to be commissioned for the railway electrification. So uh, that is it from my side and yes, as regard to the, I would say the competition, the competition is aggressive. Market is also right. aggressive and we have good opportunities available in the system. So that's a healthy scenario among all the challenges in the present scenario, I would say. All right, uh, I'll come back to you, sir. Uh, Mr. Mohan Kumar. Yeah. Same question to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, actually, we did have a bit of a setback in the first quarter of last year when uh, we were actually yes. caught absolutely unaware. And uh, most of our labor forces were migrant in nature. So we had a decimation of our workforce. It took us about four months to get back on our feet. But having learned the lessons last year, this year we managed it well. And uh, notwithstanding what happened in the first three months of last year, uh, we were able to deliver again a very large patch of dedicated freight corridor on the Western Corridor where the Prime Minister inaugurated in the month of January. And another 300 kilometers was added to that by March. So, uh, yes, and then uh, we are trying to push ahead and see that the jobs uh, which are there are finished on schedule. That is the main item. Second, yes, we have learned to cope with uh, various uh, factors. People have become more uh, flexible and understanding. People do cooperate in all fronts, uh, more so uh, from the workforce level. You know, there is a fair amount of understanding, commitment from everybody. Government on its part and the railway ministry per se has liberalized a fair amount of uh, cash flow issues so that uh, due support was given to us when it was needed. So we are always grateful to us and we have got a very patient hearing to see that the targets don't go astray. And as far mm -hmm. as the future is concerned, yes, uh, bullet train seems to be on everybody's radar, so is on ours. 
metro segment has been a bread and butter business for us for many years the one particular job that we are doing in bangalore is going on at a fairly good clip we have not had any major setbacks on that so we look forward to it uh, both in india and some opportunities abroad i think things will only go up from here so we are all go looking forward to this and uh, mr kumar what are your targets for the current fiscal uh, what are you hoping to achieve see we are trying to maintain our revenue levels for the last two years notwithstanding the fact that we have lost one or two months of productive work so our right. endeavor a is to see that uh, revenue levels don't fall b which is more important that the targets uh, which are there which are essential for the nation in terms of achieving various connectivity goals they are met and the endeavor is to see that necessary resources are put to finish these critical jobs mm -hmm. that is the Understood. let me come to my next question to all of you and that i will take to uh, miss pedi also is in terms of all of you mentioned that you have been able to uh, work around the challenges that you faced so if we keep um, covid aside for a for a few minutes and because covid was challenging for everybody and as you mentioned mr kumar also that everyone lost out on those two three months of productive work but apart from covid generally in rail construction as contractors whether it is on the electrification side or whether it's on project construction size aside what are the biggest challenges that you feel are currently surmounting these sectors as a as a contractor and what do you think needs to be done about that so maybe we we can hear from mr sankralingam first and then go back in that order yeah see we really talk about the challenges you know the construction is where i'm you know uh, lnt has been more involved particularly in a epc mode so we have a design as well as we have a uh, constructions so when we talk about right. the designs you know most of things is you know it should be require about time bound you know the the epc contract which they are talking about you know like in a highways or we talk about you know like in a metros which there is a time bound with about you know 3 to 4 years which required parallelly you have to complete the designs got it approved as well as the utilities has to be shifted and soil soil conditions has to be you know really we have to do that lot of you know uh, re you know the soil investigation to be carried out selection of the tbm so all these things which required about more detailed analysis what we found certain clients really they are very keen then they provide so many details i think for example chennai right. they have done really wonderful job they spend more time by the client and they given so many investigations so what probably as an a contractor as an a epc contractor when we step in so when we assign the confirmatory board and then what they have provided if it is tallying then it's wonderful you know that that is what normally you know every contractor required so your selection of the equipment becomes easier because there were metro projects particularly underground the biggest challenge is the correct selection of the tbm so that is the number one if some you know rather metros which is coming about so many metros i don't want to name it there's a lot of you know the inputs inputs are not up to the mark then second is about the you know the utility shiftings see that is one of the major you know when you talk about any stations about something that particular land in urban area you know big challenge start from the pipeline sort from you know electrical utilities everything you know see by doing you know tunnel boring machine is na what you need a core strength what you need to do that you know this particular shifting of this utilities diversion of that and you know that between the two departments i mean the client should think about something in a different way why they should not do it in advance if they can get clear then the project whatever right. the delay may not happen so we were all talking about after the project we got it then there is a delay of you know the utility shifting then you know everybody is looking into the why it's happening the money wise we really look into that in the big that project cost 
this particular shifting of this one, not even half a percent to one percent or two percent. But the cost of delaying the project, maybe it is about 80 to 90 percent. We talk about many of the projects in metros or in urban area. Why there is a delay? The number one cause is either land acquisitions or next one is the utility shifting. So this they have to think about. At least maybe the client really look into that, how they wanted to streamline. They wanted to either to, you know, sanitize the entire, you know, the things so that they give it to the contractor so that they are coming out with an equipment, machineries, which are all very expensive. You know that today if you, you are any of the metro jobs, looking into that, you know, the asset worth, something not less than at least maybe about, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the project cost, the asset is sitting there. So that is maybe the challenge we have to, you know, take into that one. I mean, these two things which I feel it is appropriate right. to be done. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mehta? Yeah, I think uh, as my just uh, senior colleague mentioned in the forum, the we uh, are entering into the EPC modes now more often and uh, very less uh, projects are there which are now BOQ based. So which involves, I would say, very deep knowledge of the subject, first of all, on the technicalities and the commercial front. And we also expect same detailing from client side. The tender documents need to be very specific. I mean, they cannot be, I would say, generic in nature. And then it leads to, I would say, interpretation issues at later stage, which at the end of the day delays the project. Uh, right. Both ends, I would say, from the contractor front and from the client side, if I talk about, both are technically sound. I mean, it's not that uh, no one is technically sound and they are just talking uh, haywire but point is if the things are very clearly iterated in the tender document itself or even in the pre-bid uh, discussions we have with the several contractors the contractors come up with their issues with their experiences in other projects it should be very clearly iterated in the tender documents so that everything has a time and cost involved uh, which is very essential for today's world now so at the end of the day, if these issues are not resolved timely, it will affect the progress of the works and also delay the projects. That's a big risk which we are carrying. And if we really want to be successful in the EPC mode, I would suggest that the design has to be further strengthened and we need to be adaptable to new technologies. Uh, we cannot go uh, by the thumb rule and we cannot go by the, I would say, the legacy that yes, this, this, this is the way it has been done and this is the way only it can be done. If we are entering into earlier, the projects used to come in BOQ modes. So it was a unitary item mm -hmm. and uh, we just need to execute and whatever is the variation, the contractor used to get the compensation for that. But now in the EPC mm -hmm. mode, the entire risk is with the contractor. That's the big thing. And uh, it's not only the, I would say, if the contractor failed, it's not the failure of the contractor, it's the failure of, I would say, the entire nation because ultimately that is an asset being developed for the nation. So I would urge through this forum that the things need to be more detailed and more. So from the contractor side also, we need to study uh, the details very meticulously and we need to be very thorough with the subject so that we do not miss on any fine detail which has been mentioned somewhere in the tender document, but we miss it at times. So if this way we proceed and adaptability to innovation and new technology would be the key view for future. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kumar, anything to add and then I'll go to yes. yes, I have a few observations to make on this. One is uh, the quality of inputs that are available for an EPC job today are uh, uh, okay, let me say very elementary in nature and by the time we end up actually executing the job we will see a sea change in what was actually intended and what came on the ground that also necessitates a very important aspect called contract management now whenever mm. these kind of changes occur there must be a robust enough framework envisaged within the contract to handle these kind of change management issues uh, now, probably because of the legacy cultural issues, uh, the clients do tend to take a very top-down, hand, heavy-handed approach. 
which puts the contractor at a tremendous disadvantage because uh, you end up first spending money in the interest of the project and then running from pillar to post to recover your costs. So this kind of disincentivizes the entire thrust for finishing the jobs quickly. Some of the exceptions have been uh, recent uh, dedicated freight corridor contracts where certain FIDIC terms have been involved, where the contractors do have a fair bit of leeway in uh, managing these kind of changes. But I think these things need to become more broad based so that this EPC culture actually gives the desired result in the final run. Mm. Thank you for your inputs, all of you. I'll now move to Ms. Bedi. Um, so if you would have heard from some of the contractors, uh, so what are the kind of, uh, you know, legal solutions that are, so to say, available or best practices that you could share with the panelists today that could help in addressing some of their concerns? And also, if from your experience, you could highlight, um, you know, some of the other legal challenges, uh, which in your view are also common. Sure, sure, Yataka. First of all, thank you. Thank you, India Infrastructure, for organizing this. And I think I'll start off by saying that it was really heartening and promising uh, listening to the eminent speakers in the first round about how things are progressing and things are on track and the capacity expansion is happening. That is actually much needed by the economy. So uh, great on that. Now, I think I'll start with I've heard the uh, challenges and nothing that I've heard is, um, uh, is something pretty uh, usual that we've been hearing for, for some time. And these are all absolutely apt points that have been uh, raised. And I think I'll start with some of the legal challenges and dovetailing into what uh, the other speakers have also spoken about. I think one of the biggest issues uh, with respect to the EPC contracting or even uh, get, for the railways to engage contractors for different projects is I would say lack of proper planning to begin with. And that links into not sufficient data being actually available for the contractor to evaluate uh, and then submit its bid and pricing, which eventually kind of leads to. So in terms of, if I were to say a corresponding change that would be required for the entire sector to kind of improve, would be that the tender documents are issued when the regulatory authorities, Indian Railways, uh, more so, I would say, and, and all their different agencies have done a proper evaluation of what the project entails, if it's electrification, what is the estimated cost, and during the course of time of the project, because these are uh, capital intensive, long, long uh, duration projects, what all perhaps could go wrong, and then try and encapsulate that in the various tender documents. And linked to this is proper planning and then better drafting, I would say, of tender documents, because I, I, I think it has been the case, it is pretty true that these documents have been going on historically, even the EPC models, documents that have been adopted, they have been used on the basis of your uh, PPP projects that were uh, awarded, the, the model uh, agreements. And they've been modified to use as the EPC contracts. So I think a better drafting of the documents, more clear provisions, and a better risk allocation on both the party parties, being uh, the Indian Railways and the contractor, and allocating the risk in terms of whichever entity is better suited to take that risk, like with respect to all land acquisition issues. And, and uh, the issue with respect to the utilities were mentioned by uh, Sir earlier, the movement of utilities. That's one of the prominent things that we, we see. And the usual provision does provide that the government will provide all assistance. Some documents do provide, and, and that's been the change that we've seen over a period of time, where the responsibility is being imposed on the government, but then comes the cost issue. Who's going to bear the cost? Is it going to be proportionate between the contractor and the government? So I think a better thought out approach, perhaps upfront, that these are the utilities that will need to be moved and who's going to share the cost and where we can allocate the cost for this. These are things that kind of would be really useful uh, for the projects. And then linked to it was also land acquisition. Uh, everybody knows, I think, in India, that's one of the biggest challenges. Uh, for most, we've seen for government projects, the uh, railways taking that responsibility and then providing it uh, on a license basis. But making sure that it's done well in time so that the timelines envisaged in the EPC contract don't go off is, is an important aspect. 
and also linked there are various other approvals that are required for, for a project of this nature uh, who is going to be responsible to take which uh, approvals what is the scope in the contractors what is the scope for the uh, indian railways uh, that's probably clearly getting fleshed out along with timelines and also consequences of delay happens then what is the benefit the contractor would be entitled to uh, uh, and, and things like that. Then I think I'll just mention the last bit, which was also uh, mentioned is the change in the contract management aspect, which is absolutely true yes. that during a period of time, there is change that kind of happens. Currently, uh, the current scheme of documents do have a concept of change in law uh, or a variation being proposed and then the change in scope being resulted. But the fact of how things have changed over a period of time. There's no, so to speak, concept of renegotiation of terms in our contracts. And I think that is something over a period of time, uh, I think everybody has relied is a practical reality. So to think about it and provide for that in our contract, in our contracts, which would be legally valid uh, binding documents would perhaps be best for both parties so that at least we know when we are entering into uh, the contract, even from a contractor's perspective, that these are the obligations that they are undertaking. Then they are also can manage their position well and, and take things on course. And similarly from the government side, so they, they better know how to expect uh, and, and manage things. So, so broadly, I would say uh, these, these are uh, the main factors that could be considered. Thank you. Um I'll also take the views of the panel now and then come to you also, Ms. PT, on just the current framework that is there for PPP. The PPPs have not really picked up in railways and there is talk of it getting revived and some changes being made in the MCA. So, Mr. Sankralingam, uh, what is your view if you could just briefly highlight on the current framework and uh, do you think it's sufficient to attract private participation or what more needs to be done there? I'm not clear your question. Can you just repeat? PPP, sir, public private partnership uh, has not picked up very well in railways. So, what do you think uh, is the current framework sufficient or what more can be done in that regard? See, this uh, BO, the LED call them as a BOT, built to operate transfer. So, the private yes. parties will enter into that an agreement with the client. But you know, own some, you know, the entire project, sometimes collect that, you know, the revenue through various mode, either, you know, toll or anything, but a lot of risk is involved. Where I think there is many issues has cropped up and then, you know, again, you know, the bank has also been, you know, some other company even has been bankrupt. I mean, truly speaking, you know, so many companies, they venture into that and then get into the trouble. Finally, I think, you know, they were nowhere. So, the openness from the government, you know, uh, rather it is on an operational, how these private parties are coming into the public mode, you know, and then put that the entire mm. investment and then, you know, get back the money. The Again, who's giving back the money is public. The question is asked by the public or, you know, if you really see that, you know, a couple of weeks, I mean, in the last week in Chennai, they stopped tolling off certain toll, you know, certain locations. So in public mind, people are, are you know, the developer or maybe the private parties are taking huge money. That's what they feel, how long they are collecting the tolls. So is it correct or not? Which is probably, you know, awareness of the people is, I can say that I think, you know, uh, rather it is not put into the correct manner. Rather, they, one side, you know, the public is just paying the money and then they're saying that how long these people will collect and what is that, you know, when they will stop? What is the big call? Because, you know, they may be not aware that what kind of money which is coming in, how much money it has been spent for the, you know, the, you know, developing such, a, you know, facilities, which is, you know, equivalent to that money which we are collecting it from the, the public, where it is tallying. Because one is the big money, when you take it from the bank, the bank takes the interest, which is what normally about 30 to 40 percent of the total investment which is going to be done. So, how these gaps are rather properly explained, otherwise, one way the people are talking about, oh, people are making so much money. And then, you know, they, when they will stop it, 10 years, 
10 years you are collecting the money. So a lot of percep wrong perception there with the bubbly. Now, unless otherwise, you have to bring into that, you know, the basically again, you know, the private parties which they wanted to put the money and then collect it through that can take a, so a lot of risk. And again, the government changes that are okay. Luckily, at least, you know, so far there is no rather, uh, you know, dispute or rather, you know, issues are there in the central government where a project is being taken over by any private party where they are not terminating. But the state government, I think, you know, nobody is willing to take such a risk because they're all really get, get into that, you know, on a uh, different mode of things. So this, my view, if it is really the government wants the private party to come inside, how they are going to explain to the people or rather the public, which they do not have much, whatever we call them is, you know, literature of whole thing, the country still, I think, you know, I can say about we are come up to maybe around 50, 60. So the balance 40, 50, 35 to 40 percent of the public doesn't have go into this detail why it should be required so much expensive, all kind of things, which is really, you know, matters how they are going to get this kind of, you know, the mindset with both people as well as the people. Otherwise, there is a lot of, you know, a fun but annuity mode comes, but you know, again, it is a problem is, you know, again, the bank, again, bank is gone. Bank also, you know, miss very big, you know, the default because the contractor is failed, the bank is failed, then the bank also failed. There's issues are there. It's it's big challenge because money is not small. It's about not about a hundred crore thousand things. It goes into really in thousands of crores. So it is very big risk involved. So how to take it? In fact, they when they started, you know, they formed a committee and then the committee has given recommendations. Then there was issues cropped up, all those things. I mean, it's need to be a lot of debate required and then to take it forward to that, you know, on an equal platform to that when government as well as the entrepreneur who is coming in and public because here the public is, you know, playing the very, very, very vital role. So how do we, you know, satisfy these three people is very important. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mehta, same question to you. So as you must be aware that PPPs are now being proposed in uh, station development, railway operations, facility management. So how do you think this is going to fare, fare up going forward? And is there any revenue model uh, for such projects uh, that, that you're aware of? Yeah, first of all, uh, PPP model has not been a success so far, I would say, across right. all the industry segments, whether you talk highways, whether you talk railways, whether you talk power. Correct. Reason being that when the moment you come into the PPP mode, we need to be more transparent. Uh, when it's a partnership, mm. it's not uh, no no more. It's a relation between a client and a contractor. First thing, and we need to be very, as I mentioned earlier, also we need to be very particular and meticulous about the terms and condition. Why the PPP models are not succeeding is because there are a lot of ambiguities in the contract agreement. There are a lot of hidden facts in the contract agreement which are encountered during the execution. And at that moment, then it becomes a stalemate position. Who will bear the cost? Whether the contractor will bear the cost, whether government will bear the cost, or whether client will bear the cost. And as there is no clarity and nobody takes the onus to resolve it, the position remains sustained on a stalemate mode for years and years. So this way, the model will collapse. This way, the model cannot, I would say, be sustainable for a couple of years. Now, we are talking about highway projects in PPP mode. We are talking about railway projects like dedicated freight corridor is also coming up in a PPP mode. So these are mega projects, I would say, in the size of 10,000 crores, 9,000 crores. And mm -hmm. we expect to be and government has a big role to play in it because a lot of issues we have uh, encountered in our past also where land acquisition or administrative approvals are delayed. Ultimately, then the onus lies on the contractor that this is delayed and uh, we can't help you out with the compensation. So in the PPP mode, we already have stringent cost metrics. The financial model, if we talk, 
in that the cost is already very stringent the com market is very competitive nobody has that leverage that they can i would say load that cost into their matrix then they will not be competitive at all in the market so the these things can be resolved only when the contract is very clear for the unforeseen issues also we have a lot of experiences in front of us and we can articulate it that in case there is a administrative approval delay who will bear the cost it can be very categorically mentioned at the tender stage itself in case it is a land acquisition problem or a forest clearance issue or i would say any encroachment issue is there especially on the highways and the railways then who will bear the cost and sometimes in the contract it mentions that it will compensate the contractor for time it mentions but what about the cost that they are silent then we land up into arbitrations disputes and the entire project goes for a toss and then the motivation also goes off that uh, then that relation also starts up, i would say bitter taste to be very honest that you have filed an arbitration against us uh, why should we support you why should we take this uh, all these things can be sorted out only when the contract is very clear and uh, i would say government also has a very big role to play in this we look forward that right. yes uh, Anything we are add? still keen we are still keen to be participating in the ppp mode uh, rather we are very mm. uh, actively participating also um, whether it is power whether it is highway whether it is railways right mr kumar in some time in future there is some stalemate position then how do we deal with it right anything to add mr kumar before i go yeah most thing. of it has been well articulated i just want to add one thing as a pure investment proposal people would like to have a guarantee if possible a sovereign guarantee for a mega project of this kind of orders or some kind of a collateral and a fallback now these are the things which are absolutely lacking and uh, the recent examples of uh, a delhi airport metro or mumbai metro line 1 all of these so called ppp which were held up as shining examples have collapsed and gone back to government lap only because of these issues so uh, we need to address the thing and uh, you know identify the elephant in the room so to say yeah miss beti what would you like to i know that you have a detailed session uh, later in the day on this okay. but anything you'd like to summarize here on your views and then i'll take the audience questions yeah, yeah sure sure i think uh, it's um, i think whatever has been said about the ppp model is is right so uh, unfortunately i think in the railway sector uh, the ppp model hasn't been successful and hasn't evolved that much uh, because if you see historically when it kind of started uh, way back in 2012 actually uh it's been only two models right as is was mentioned one one is the whole bot model where it is kind of uh, rail connectivity gets done uh and then it is the uh, other model is the annuity model and where how the annuity would work with it, whether it would be linked to the entire freight collection and the freight it is all being entirely shared with the uh, uh, with the actual contractor or the partner in in the case of uh, the private entity who's entered into the ppp model Th those are not kind of so to speak as clear as they should be and also again who takes responsibility of which risk so i think the question is of evolving these models and and recently i think there has been a lot of uh, discussions and a lot of ppp models um, uh, with respect to the private train operations i think that's been the big one uh, i won't talk about much about that because we are actually working on that we are we are the legal advisors on on right. the private uh, train operation which is kind of currently uh, ongoing and even the station development i think these are great initiatives a great initiative what actually the country needs uh, it's a question of uh, whether we can um, evolve and change and kind of get to a position where we can kind of get it right to get the appropriate private and foreign investment so that's mm -hmm. broadly where and also i think i i would just close with uh, enforcement is indeed a big challenge uh, of of contracts and that's also a big deterrent for any of the contractors uh, with with the world bank uh, records showing india on an average we take about 4 years and 31% of the cost of of the claim 
uh, gets spent on actually uh, doing the enforcement. So these are the issues where uh, the government definitely needs to step in and, and try and kind of change things which could, could promote the uh, investor sentiment and promote them to invest in it. I'll take some of the audience questions now and just quickly try to take them and address it to one speaker at a time. Uh, maybe Mr. Sankralingam, the first question you can answer. What is the construction opportunity in railway of the total railway budget? Do you have some estimate or idea on this? See, the railway is a little bit, you know, uh, uh, particularly Indian railways where the construction things is being now not properly it is being spelt out because it is being diverted to the metros and main line which is very very few except i think some maintenance and maybe reconstructions only which is not on a very big number where we are not really focusing that i mean to be frank we are not focusing that metros yes but okay. in railways but in yeah. of the railway budget is there any percentage number you can attach to construction opportunity in railway of the total railway budget that's allocated every year? Yeah, which is normally, you know, which is happening about in the range of about, you know, 15, 20 percent, which is coming in a development right. mode. So that it's really it's coming into that, you know, like particularly metros as well as, you know, sector like, you know, the Kongan railways and maybe about some other development on the northeastern and maybe about, you know, the on the Eastern Front. So there's a lot of project is coming up quite good. There's no issue at all. So we'll have that kind of an attractions will be there. Next question for uh, Mr. Mehta and Mr. Kumar. Both of you can answer this probably. Uh, what construction orders are expected in the next three DFC corridors? And are they likely to come up in financial year 23 or 24? Mr. Mehta, maybe. You can answer first. Yeah, and they are very actively, I would say, and they are also very aggressive uh, to come up in by 2023. And uh, we are also very uh, hopeful about it, and it will be really revamp the entire ecosystem of our country. Okay. And Mr. Kumar, a similar yes, answer? Yes, you... yes, because there's the same thing. The organization is very dynamic they are looking at it in an aggressive fashion now that the success mm -hmm. has been tested in both east and west so north south right. and the east west corridor is going to take off it will take off it will take off. okay uh, next question again uh, to each one of you maybe mr mehta you can answer first uh, with uh, most of the electrification tasks being done uh, what what are the opportunities you can uh, look at in the future, like what will substitute electrification orders in future, which have already reached their peak in uh, 1920. Uh, Mr. Mehta. Okay, I think he's not available. So, uh, Mr. Kumar, if you could uh, answer that. No, that is not the uh, area of my Hi. expertise, so Mr. I would not be able to answer it. Uh, although Mr. Mehta would be uh, I think back uh, soon. But uh, till that time, uh, is LNT involved in electrification orders? And what do you think is going to substitute in, it in the future? See, electrifications, you know, substitutions, you know, where I think, uh, uh, particularly in terms of the railways, uh, we are moving into that maybe smart world, all those kind of things, you know. But, it, it's far away from this, you know, the core business, which is will be more on the, you know, the uh, rather smart city or rather we were looking into that maybe about the next. So these kind of things, which is probably, you know, more on the, you know, uh, uh, on, a, on a, you know, the database and then, you know, on more on the, you know, the uh, e base kind of things. So. Since we have, you know, big conglomerate, you know, where I think, you know, various other, you know, you know, business, not only that railways plus, you know, smart world as well as, you know, the, uh, because government is uh, wanted to spend about a lot of, you know, the projects in the smart world and then, you know, the development of the urban urbanization. So there, I think we got a lot of other interests are there. So that is what I can say that. 
all right uh, next question is that uh, being uh, I, I you how would you look at operating private trains um, is that an opportunity area for you will it be profitable for you um, as well uh, maybe mr sankralingam can take it up first and then i can ask mr kumar see lnt venture into that you know most of the you know uh, taking a lot of risk on the first come any projects but operating really the train or the you know particular you know segments rather you know move into that you know operating gaining everything yes we will really look into that the revenue mode and probably you know the kind of you know the traffic availability and how this you know the big challenge will be about you know the getting the land how this government is going to open up that whether are they going to be rather you know on a open because you know any highway project or any of the development project you know getting the land is the biggest question challenges you know our system is such a way that it's all become about you know split into that you know the small parcel parcel of land and how that the government is thinking into you know transferring into the you know the private partners and then offering that you know kind of a running into that because you need all these kind of things to be done yes we can think about you know uh, getting that you know rather you know as hyderabad metro we are still running entire you know and that's in the main highway which they are trying to give it as available but if you are looking for about across country with some kind of an you know, railway wanted to they wanted to run you know that challenge is there how they are going to get it then if that is the case yes there mm -hmm. will be openness to participate into that right another question that is coming now uh, for all of you is that how are the orders flow looking in the first half of fy22 and are you getting a sense of order pick up in the second half uh, maybe mr kumar you can start first if you can just yeah, actually uh, there has been no dearth of opportunities uh, in terms of the new okay. projects that are coming up or the new tenders that are getting floated uh, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact uh, the entire uh, railway system has worked as if covid did not exist that was the kind of a bottom line of the approach so uh, a there has never been a dearth so the question of upswing is not there so it's going to be the normal way and whatever the prime minister kind of announces ambitious targets so the tenders and the opportunities are uh, kind of growing in the same okay. way as it is announced so we are seeing um, enough opportunities in various aspects of railway business as of now Mm -hmm. Mr. Mehta, um, similar answer, I think. Uh, you mentioned this in the beginning also. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. And uh, we are really aggressive and we are really hopeful that the ecosystem develops that way itself. And there would be a good order uh, flow in the market in all the segments, mm -hmm. uh, in the highways, in the railways. And even for the power sector, also, the government of India is very aggressive. They're coming up with many TPCB model, PPP model projects in the near future which is, which is the need of the hour also so, so in railways we are also you are definitely more. expecting an upswing in railways as well right um okay next question is that uh, how many civil contracts of indian railways rvnl dfc hsr core zonal railways etc do lnt and texmaco have in hand presently uh, mr sankralingam uh for HSR, I think we have already secured about, you know, some uh, more than three, pro three, three projects. We already secured C4, C6, and then that, uh, you know, RV0407, which is, you know, uh, exclusively the, you know, the bridge packages. And uh, now a couple of things, which is also on the, you know, the current, the bidding mode is going on. So we are pretty sure, I think, you know, we will be landing up, you know, a couple of projects. There is no doubt at all. But the challenges, I think, the executions. Now, I think, you know, since after COVID, now I think, you know, the things are going up. Now, client expectation is going up because they want everything, you know, reality, what's happening, what is the progress. So that is one of the challenges there. And when we talk about the metros, there's no doubt at all. I think, you know, whatever, I think, you know, we have Chennai Metro, we are doing about, we got a two package recently. And then third one is also, we were two packages, we were, I mean, single bidder, 
but client again thinking about what to do further, whether we can place order or because it's a bit challenges. It's not that I think you know it is mm -hmm. Mumbai, of course, there are out of the underground. Uh, RB, what about RBNL DFC? RB yeah, RBNL, we have been, you know, we got a two big packages in the you know on the Himachal, almost about each one two thousand crore project. And also, you know, the RRTS, which is connecting the, you know, Delhi and Meerut. So we have got almost three packages, which is going on a full swing. And uh, Bangalore Metro, two more, two packages, which we are doing that. So there's no problem at all. I mean, you know, plus again, you know, the DMRC is coming up, a lot of other packages on the, I think the, okay. uh, they call them as an a fourth one and the things. So there is no doubt, no depth of job is concerned. So it's, it's okay. It's going on very well. Yeah. And a similar question was there for you, Mr. Kumar also. So uh, if you could High speed, speed, yes. We have a fair amount of, uh, you know, at least three, four packages of track laying will come up. One of them has already come where all of us have made a bid. And uh, yeah, there are plenty of uh, tenders floating around in the market, so there's no dearth of jobs. Uh, are, are you aware of any uh, other uh, bullet train uh, project that's going to be announced soon? Uh, would you be aware of that? Or is it just the Maharashtra section uh, which is there up for bidding? So apart from that, any other uh, bidding project that you're aware of? Any of you? No, I don't think so. Any other project has come to the stage of bidding. Most of them are in the conceptual stage. So, understood. And uh, any large tunnel orders likely in uh, financial year 22-23, like Rudrapur RBNL project for LNT or Tata? Uh, Mr. Mehta, any large tunnel orders which is likely yeah, in financial uh, year? Presently, we are already executing in the Western DFCC in near Maharashtra. And uh, we are in active discussion with the RBNL for this Rudrapur package. But I would say it's uh, in the conceptual stage at right now. And we expect that by 2022, it should be in the bidding stage. So okay. we are hopeful that it should be in the market. And Mr. Sankralingam, any tunnel orders that you are expecting? No. Uh... This RVNL, both are tunnel. You know, it's one is an atom, other one is the TVM. Now, apart from that, I think, you know, a couple of tender is being, you know, we have been, you know, seriously bidding that. So I don't want to say anything much more about because some of the things which is going on, like, you know, Tata project was telling that. So it's, it's going on. But rather, you know, uh, we'll see when it concludes. Yes, it will come into the public more. Yes. Hmm. Okay, uh, another question that has come in and, and I think we can close here. In some projects, especially doubling and third line due to non-finalization of ESP of yards prior to a board of tender, the project get delayed, projects get delayed. This occurs especially in third line and fourth line or doubling of railway project. Uh, is a commonly faced issue and uh, any comments on how you're looking to resolve this in order to avoid delay of the project? Uh, any one of you can comment? This is not a thing that is in any of our hands. As we had initially mm -hmm. remarked, this is about the quality of input that forms the basis of tendering. Mm -hmm. So this again points yeah. to the same issue. So uh, this issue needs to be addressed to the person who is floating the tender, not the person who is receiving the tender. There is very little that we can do about this. Thank you for your comment. Uh, last question. Uh, how are you handling cement and steel price hike? And does price variation cause uh, clause cover inflation? Uh, Mr. Mehta and Mr. Sankrindlam, maybe you can comment now, Mr. Mehta. Yeah, as I already mentioned that one side, the market is very uh, competitive and aggressive. On the other side, the commodity prices are sky high. So it's, I would say, a paradigm shift and it's really a challenge for all of us because we have stringent timelines uh, for the execution and at the same time this price hike the pv formula which you ask the price variation formula does not compensate well for these escalations 
in certain contract it does but not majorly our contracts so it's again a cost bearing effect for all and uh, which in a way also impacts the progress i would say in my opinion this is a serious issue which needs to be i would say looked upon by the government also and by the clients also because at the end of the day the project timeline is supreme the rest is mm -hmm. just i would say and mr sankralingam anything yeah. to add uh, i wanted to add this you know or other uh, in fact the minister himself has been start appealing to the you know the railway department you know the steel you know the producers why are you doing like that um, you know <laughs> It's, it's a little uh, awkward for the railway minister, rather, you know, the ministry from the, you know, the highways, they saying that because again, we'll go back to, you know, if, if the, the things which is beyond the, you know, any own hand, definitely, you know, we'll go back to the client. So the client again, you know, will look into the diesel all, you know, it's coming from the, again, the same sector of, you know, the uh, steel facts, you know, the kind of cement. So he is appealing, you know, it's, it's something which is, we need probably, you know, maturity level is probably it is missing. Plus, maybe about there's a lot of pressure coming from the external factor, like, you know, Chinese, you know, where I believe they probably stop, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, exporting these, you know, steel and then they start importing. That means the problem there, you know, our Indian market is become about, you know, so wise, so why we should not take the you know good money? In fact, they have been showing beautiful result in the you know uh, particularly steel and cement. A lot of you know that see that the, the bottom line quite good reason because you know they are selling good the price. Well, I think you know this how again you know we'll go back to that you know the government how they are going to balance it. They got so many facility you know rather you know non trade or maybe about many things they are trying to do it but still they are unable to you know control. But we have to go through that. I think, you know, the line, rather bottom line will have a lot of pressure. So how we have to mitigate that the whole thing, so which we have to take care of that. It's a challenge. There's Ms. No Bedi, anything, like, anything you'd like to add to this last question on cement and steel yeah. price high? Yeah, I think it links to the whole uh, contract price uh, provisions right. and everything, which typically in an EPC model construct is a fixed uh, uh, price concept, fixed lump sum price, and that's the whole idea of moving towards uh, EPC contract. And it does provide very, very specific instances uh, in which this price can be varied. And sometimes you see uh, input cost uh, being varied as a criteria for price modification. But I would say for most, uh, it's not that common that you would get that advantage uh, with respect to any input cost going up. It being so it. Completely depends on the on, on the contract, but it's not a norm typically to see in APC contracts that you will get the benefit, and that kind of leaves uh, the contractor open to uh, additional costs and not being certain how they get paid. All right. On that note, uh, we'll close the session. Thank you so much for your time today, all of you.